Welcome to this module on mineral nutrition and reproductive performance. In this module, we'll be looking at how we can optimize reproductive performance through good mineral nutrition. The first portion of this module will be handled by Dr. Mike Hutchins, talking about mineral nutrition and its influence on reproductive performance. I'll then follow up with some specifics about our SQM trace mineral line and its influence on reproductive performance. Well, certainly uh, uh, this topic, minerals and reproduction, is important, and we're going to give you a quick update on some of the nuances and opportunities looking at this phase of the feeding program. Let's begin by talking about what I call micronutrients, and minerals and vitamins and additives would fall into that. We call them micronutrients because we normally are adding these in small amounts, uh, grams of calcium, uh, milligrams of zinc, for example. So it's not like uh, uh, 50 pounds of dry matter or 4 kilograms of, uh, of protein. Normally, they are not routinely measured in uh, rations and labs, and one of the reasons, of course, is our NIR units cannot see them because they have no carbon in them. So therefore, we don't see them tested like we do with NDF and ADF. Another aspect is that usually these are small cost items in the ration. Typically, 30, 40 cents a day will get your mineral programs delivered to your dairy cattle. And of course, immediately, there's no response. In other words, if I add zinc tomorrow, milk production will not go up uh, two pounds in three or four days. So certainly, uh, it is not quite as dynamic of a nutrient as you would with energy or protein. When we look at mineral factors, some of the minerals are related to milk production. For example, you'll see listed there calcium, phosphorus, and potassium. Other minerals are related to gestation. Selenium and phosphorus and manganese would play into that, and you'll see a few more a bit later. Certainly, the ration of the benefit to cost ratio, in other words, if I'm going to buy a certain mineral program and it costs me 10 cents, I expect to get at least 20 cents of value back on that. And finally, certain minerals are related to stages of lactation. For example, the transition cow, certainly you'd see some of our trace minerals having a much bigger role there than they will in, say, the lactating cow. We look at the, the three principles, I call them the ABC factors. When we look at minerals, availability, in other words, just because I feed calcium doesn't mean the cow absorbs that calcium. It could be tied up as an oxalate, for example. There could be interactions. For example, copper and moly have interactions. Another aspect is balance, and especially in our trace minerals. Sometimes if you overfeed one trace mineral, it biologically reduces the absorption of the other trace mineral in, in the program. And of always, uh, we are in the dairy industry, and its cost, and certainly what are the economics of making these changes. A fun slide to look at, and this one has trace minerals on it because it really is a big driver, was one that was put together a couple of years ago in which we looked at how, how do we know what kind of responses we're going to see. And, and we see over on the left side the green arrow. That's where you want to be. In my view, if the price of milk is $10 or $20 or $30, for example, if you're in Canada, then obviously we want to be in the green area because then we start going into the orange, which is the caution area. And you can see that things start happening. And this a research group pulled this together. It's not my PowerPoint. shows that the immune system, and we'll talk more about that in another module another time, and enzyme functions can be affected. This is very difficult to see, though, on the dairy farm. Then we start seeing some things that can affect uh, performance, growth, and fertility. And then finally, you'll see uh, uh, we don't get optimal growth, but we get suboptimal growth and a reduction in fertility. And then eventually you get into clinical signs. In other words, there are very classic symptoms of zinc deficiencies, copper deficiencies. Trust me, we don't want to be there because obviously these animals are in big trouble. So that's another challenge is sometimes the responses we're monitoring are not easy to see, especially with the trace minerals. Then I thought we should look at what are the, the, the big players. And, and this is my bias. Every nutritionist will be slightly different. In my view, what minerals really have impact on reproduction? Uh, phosphorus, and you could also and indirectly put calcium with that if you wish. Uh, zinc, copper, manganese, and selenium. And these will impact reproduction either directly, they may come through immune system response, the health of the uterine wall, the development of the fetus, or it may even have some effects on, for example, selenium in terms of retained placenta. But certainly, in my view, this would be the right answer if you're saying, well, what are the minerals we really want to be aware of when we're looking specifically at reproductive performance? 
you'll see a couple of PowerPoints coming now on our recommendations. I'm not going to walk you through all these numbers. These are the macro minerals. Uh, these are fed in terms of grams per day, usually expressed as percent of the ration dry matter. And I thought out of fun, we'd put up NRC 89, NRC 2001, which are guidelines the industry uses. And then you'll see U of I extension. And you see, we will play and change these numbers around just a little bit. A little more aggressive on calcium, for example. Uh, a little bit more aggressive, especially heat stress on potassium. A little more aggressive on sulfur because of its effects it may have on sulfur amino acids in hoof health. So certainly this would be one table. Uh, each of you will have this table in your file and maybe slightly different. On the microminerals, the same format. Now you can see them listed over here. We have some of them listed. I'll not read those to you. Again, you can always print this table out if you want, or review it a bit later, or actually stop the module and look at it if you wish. And again, you can see the NRC requirement, the Illinois guidelines over here. And not a, notice on the right side, we now put a max in. And we're suddenly now some of these trace minerals, if you get them really high, they can have some biological effect either on the animal or in the blood levels or some performance in the animal. Delivering these trace minerals can be done usually through some type of a mineral package. Here you'll see this is the actual numbers I target. This is what I would add to the lactating and the dry cow ration. And again, these are uh, milligrams per cow per day. So you can see I'd be adding 1,000 milligrams of zinc. Let's just remember that number a bit later because we'll talk a little bit about organic trace minerals here. Delivering this can be done by a number of different uh, mixes. Uh, companies have these pre-mixes or VTMs, they sometimes call them. This is one we have at the U of I. And we feed this at a one-tenth pound per cow per day rate, both lactating and dry cows. And this will deliver those trace mineral numbers we saw in the previous slide. We also have our vitamins A, D, and E in there. So if you look at that, this will deliver 100,000 of A, 30,000 of D, and 1,000 of E. So again, uh, you need to look at this tag and then max it up to the previous numbers to see how many milligrams your trace mineral package is going to deliver. We mentioned earlier that the relationship between minerals can be important, and these are just some of them that are important. You can see, for example, we have a zinc-copper ratio there. Uh, we know that one is important. There is a classic one, the copper moly or molybdenum at 6 to 1. So if moly starts increasing, if you're living in Ohio and the Washington state and some other areas in the U.S., moly can pop up in the feed. You can see, for example, the last one, nitrogen to sulfur. That's an amino acid synthesis in the rumen. So you can see these ratios have different functions in terms of in terms of antagonists, in terms of complementation, in terms of uh, relationship to other nutrients. Another co controversial topic is the uh, methods. Uh, we are going to recommend force feeding our minerals to our dairy cattle. We think we know better what they need. Uh, injectable trace minerals is another one. Uh, here's just a quick example, one commercial product. You can see uh, the levels and uh, uh, that are uh, that's contained in a five uh, millimeter injection, which is the recommended level by that company. You can see they give three shots a day. Now remember, if I inject this, I'm going to be injecting in about 200 milligrams of zinc. Remember, the requirement we had in the previous table was 1,000 milligrams per day. So again, you can see if you read down here, it, the concept is to try to top off what is already being recommended by the nutritionist or the feeding company uh, out there at that stage of the game. It's not to replace or, or, or be the major mineral feeding program. Some of these are RX, which means are recommended by the veterinarian. And you can see the results if you look at our variable. Some of the journal articles show no response. Some of the field studies show some positive. And I just listed one example as it relates to reproduction. Then let's look at another way of uh, delivering uh, minerals to our cows, and that, of course, would be organic minerals. Now, these are going to be force-fed, so the less, so certainly we're looking at different types. And you can see these are the various classifications that are registered with the feed industry, and most, if not all, organic trace minerals are going to fall into one of those four categories. But the, the key here, organic, simply tells you and I that this is somehow tied to a carbon structure. That could be an amino acid, that could be a protein complex, that could be a carbohydrate complex. It could even be a lipid product as far as that goes. But uh, that's what differentiates them, for example, like from salt. Salt would be inorganic, that is sodium and chloride. Every feed company, every nutritionist, every extension worker have a little different philosophy. Generally, we are recommending organic trace minerals for the following reasons. Number one, I think we'll find, and we know the research says better absorption. 
and especially when there is an antagonist. An antagonist could be a nutrient, that could be another mineral, could be something in the water, who knows what it is, but restricts the absorption of or and utilization of that mineral, in this case a trace mineral. We think the form of the mineral is very important here because then it can get into important biological processes in the body, such as the immune function. And if I can enhance the immune function, then that obviously is going to improve reproductive performance, and certainly it can get to different pools in the body as well. So certainly we know there's also an associated cost with that. So certainly now we look at strategies, and my strategy would be to recommend with organic trace minerals is to provide 25 to 33 percent of the total supplemented zinc, copper, and manganese as an organic mineral source. Remember we said zinc, 1,000 milligrams, so we'd be supplementing 250, 300, 350, 400 milligrams of the zinc as organic. Then the other would come from zinc sulfate or zinc chloride or some or inorganic sources. That balances off response versus cost. You'll notice on selenium, we are recommending to add about 50% of the selenium as organic, 100% of the dry cows as organic selenium. I would target cows that uh, the data is very clear, embryo transfer cow, both donor and recips, clear, uh, better reproductive responses there. So basically, we would look at putting this into diets when we have cows that are open. So certainly early lactation would be a very logical place to be. Environmentally stressed cows, these would be cows under heat stress, cold stress, could be cows under some type of manure uh, activity at this stage, or even disease stresses to try to help the immune system. So we are recommending definitely to put them into the far-off, close-up, and early lactation cow diets. Certainly in Illinois, usually that means all cows are getting them. And with a very modest increase in cost, that's a fairly easy recommendation to keep the organic trace minerals in the entire lactating diet. So my take-home messages would be uh, when we look at mineral programs, number one, the, the way to feed trace minerals is a forced feeding program. I think you're going to look at feeding it in terms of the actual amounts rather than percentages or parts per million, so grams or milligrams per day. I think number two is strategically consider where you want to put your organic trace mineral program based on research results and needs of those dairy cattle. And then finally, be aware of interactions, relationships, and interfering compounds that may exist out there on dairy farms. I would now like to turn the program over to Dr. Jack Garrett. He is the Director of Technical Support and Research with Qualtech. Thank you, Mike. Now I'll cover the information that we have on our SQ and Trace Mineral line and its influence on reproductive performance. Our SQM Trace Mineral products utilize the polytransport technology. This involves utilizing polysaccharides to encase, enrobe, to protect these trace minerals from interaction with antagonists in the diet and in the environment. These are considered organic trace minerals, and we protect primarily zinc, copper, manganese, iron, and magnesium. It's not an ionic or covalent bonding. It's more of a sequestering with electrostatic bonding, putting a barrier between antagonists and these important trace minerals. The other aspect of our product is that it's got high solubility, so it works well in liquid feeds and in water applications. The first study I'd like to review is a trial that was conducted at the University of Minnesota with beef cattle on pasture. This was a suspected operation or pasture where we had manganese deficiencies. We supplemented with our SQM manganese and saw an improvement in days to conception and pregnancy at first service. We saw significant improvements in those. We did also look at additions of copper and zinc but they really didn't show any additional benefits showing that we were really dealing with something that was binding up the manganese and not allowing it to be absorbed and utilized by the animals. So again, this was really a target study that showed your organic trace minerals aren't always going to be a feed additive or a real benefit, but it's really a target usage of these types of products. This study conducted at Colorado State University was again with a beef pasture operation in which we looked at before calving, after calving, and at calving body condition scores. Supplementation was either one time NRC, one and a half times NRC, or SQM trace minerals at one time NRC. What we are able to see from this is that we were able to keep body condition scores at a higher level, a significantly higher level, by supplementing with SQM. There were some antagonists in these pastures that were pulling down the overall bioavailability of these trace minerals that even 
a higher level of supplementation above NRC was not able to overcome. The SQM provided that protection to allow those cows to absorb the trace minerals and hold their body condition score better. This study is a dairy trial that was conducted at the University of Minnesota by Dr. Hugh Chester Jones. In this study, we had four different treatments. The first treatment was NRC levels strictly provided by sulfates for zinc, copper, manganese, and iron. In the second treatment, we had 100% replacement of those trace minerals with our SQM products. Then we had two other treatments, one where we only supplied 33% replacement with our SQM products, and we used another commercial product at a 33% replacement rate. What we can see in the days open is that there was a significant reduction in days open when we went to the 100% SQM compared to the sulfates 113 versus 173 days. The 33% applications were similar and were intermediate to the higher level uh, that we provided with the SQM at 100%. What this shows is that, again, the supplementation at 33% didn't allow complete overcoming of the antagonists that were in these diets and that we really needed to go to a much higher level to get the animals to have the optimum performance that they could have on days open. This slide shows the first service conception rate. It follows that same pattern that we saw in days open with the 100% SQM treatment having a very high first service conception rate. It was significantly greater than the other three treatments, and the other three treatments averaged around 30% first service conception rate. When we look at culling rate, which is very important for all dairy operations, we want to minimize culling due to reproductive performance so that we can keep those high producing dairy cows on the dairy for as long a period of time as we can. We can see from this slide that again there was a reduction in overall culling rate when we had the 100% SQM treatment in there. It was down to 16% for this reproductive performance. When the sulfates were involved, that was up to about 44% and the 33% replacements both were intermediate and averaged around 30 percent uh, culling rate. From this information, we can see that SQM has a real benefit in being able to keep your reproductive performance at an optimum level by delivering those trace minerals on an effective basis and overcoming any antagonists. I'd like to thank Dr. Hutchins for his participation in this module. If you have any questions for him, please contact him at his email address at the University of Illinois. If you have any questions for me, please contact me at my email address and would be happy to have any discussions with you on this. Thank you for listening and have a good day.